Welcome to the Group Dentistry Now Show, the voice of the DSO industry. Kim Larson and Bill Newman talk to industry leaders about their challenges, successes, and the future of group dentistry. Visit groupdentistrynow.com for more DSO analysis, news, and events. Looking for a job or have a job to fill? Visit joindso.com. We hope you enjoy today's show. Welcome, everyone, to the Group Dentistry Now Show. I'm Bill Newman, and as always, we appreciate you tuning in. We're closing in on our 200th podcast. We're not quite there yet, but um, really appreciate the support, listeners out there, and the feedback. We always try and get interesting guests on the show, and we have two on the show today. Really happy to have Dr. Jane Wang. She is the Regional Clinical Director of Benevis, and we have the CEO of Benevis, Brian Carey. So, Dr. Wang and and Brian, thank you both for being here today. This is going to be a fun conversation. Bill, thanks for having us. I really appreciate the opportunity. So why don't we start off um, with you, Dr. Jane Wang, a little little bit about your background. I mean, you have a really interesting, I was reading through your bio, and you didn't start off, Look, at least it seems like, you didn't necessarily want to become a dentist right away. You went to school. You got a psychology degree. You got a you got a master's in elementary education. You were an eighth grade science teacher for four years in New York City, and then somehow you decided you wanted to go back to school to become a dentist. So, Dr. Jane Wang, can you talk a little bit about um, you know that journey? Of course. First of all, thank you so much, Bill, for having us on this podcast. Um, Yeah, in my former life, uh, I wanted to be a teacher since I was little, and I fulfilled that dream. And I wanted to be a teacher in the urban area. So I was a New York City middle school science teacher, and I loved it. Uh, But I think it was around the third year where I felt a little burnt out, and I felt like I loved uh, being with the students, uh, but I would I thought, hey, I could do this as a volunteer uh, activity, and I wanted to do something different. And then I came across dentistry. Um, and after dental school, I thought, hey, uh, I got a little sidetracked, and I thought I wanted to do cosmetic dentistry. So I did that in a private office setting after graduating. But uh, I love the clinical part of it, but I knew that something was missing, which was working with children and uh, the underserved communities. And so that's when I came across Venevis, uh, where the mission is to provide access to care for that community that I had a passion for originally as a teacher. And so I love that I can marry my personal and professional interests together. And uh, that's what led me to Venevis as an associate dentist 15 years ago. 15 years ago. And so you were, you were a teacher in New York City, you went to Columbia for your master's in elementary education, and then also you went back there for dental school. Uh, and, and then you moved uh, down to, um, you're, you're based out of Maryland right now, correct? Yes, yes. So New York, New Jersey is my hometown. Uh, but at the time, uh, uh, I came across Benevis, which was located in Baltimore. Um, and so I relocated to Baltimore, Maryland, where I didn't know a single person, uh, but I loved uh, the people I met uh, during my interviewing process at Benevis. So I knew that it was a place that I wanted to be. Um, so I relocated for the company. Excellent. And and and, and Brian Carey, Chief Executive Officer 20 years of experience in multi-site healthcare. Uh, you're involved in oncology, uh, physician practice management, behavioral health, hospital-based services. So um, I could see how you could pivot relatively easily over to, to dental, but let's, let's talk a little bit about your background, Brian. Sure. Um, uh, thanks, Bill. Uh, as uh, you indicated, uh, over 20 years of uh, multi-site healthcare experience. So um, I uh, went to business school, uh, ended up working with a company in durable medical equipment, actually, uh, wheelchairs, walkers, and canes. Um, uh, but the end market was healthcare. Um, and, you know, quite frankly, just found if you're going to spend the better part of your working day doing something, it's great to do it where you're improving people's lives and improving outcomes. 
And uh, I've done that in a few different sectors in sort of traditional healthcare, uh, oncology, uh, substance use, uh, behavioral. Um, and then three and a half years ago, became involved with Benevis, and then two and a half years ago, stepped in as CEO. Um, the two things that are different from my prior experiences, one is, um, you know, focused on the the underserved communities. So uh, we're over 80% uh, Medicaid beneficiaries. Uh, the second thing is, it's really the first time I've been in an organization where uh, the mission of the enterprise is really an asset of the business. Um, you know, we have people who, you know, choose to work at Benevis uh, partially or in many cases largely because uh, they really relate to serving underserved families. And so um, it's kind of a big responsibility because uh, kind of valuing that asset of that business and making sure that we continue to be true to it is just critical to our success and our growth. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, I'd love to get you a little bit deeper into that mission of benefits and um and you mentioned it earlier that you are really focused on underserved children and their families and and maybe why it's so important to to oral health you know that benefits exists and that that who that's your focus but um dr wang and and, and um ryan it'd be great to just find out a little bit more about that and it's um this is going to be a deep discussion on this um this underserved audience because it's so important. And I know there's a lot of challenges that you face too, but maybe you have a little bit more about that mission. Sure. So, um, you know, at its core uh, is really that it, it's a challenge for families in underserved communities to be able to get care. Um, and uh, our mission is to uh, really enable that care to occur uh, and so it really has, you know, uh, sort of three components. Uh, first and most important is access and availability. Um, it's just the case that, you know, people's lives are busy getting kids to school, getting to work, you know, handling in some cases, you know, um, uh, caregiving of parents while also, you know, taking care of uh, children and working and so our way of really helping that is access and availability. What does that mean? It means, you know, extended hours. It means, you know, Saturdays. It means uh, having, um, you know, uh, our offices in uh, locations that are easily accessible by transportation and mass transportation. Uh, the second thing is, you know, just, of course, a tremendous focus on high quality care. Uh, it's important because, again, it's a challenge for our patients to get to our offices, just the complexities of life. And so we want to make sure we take every opportunity we can to do a lot of preventative care so that if they, for some chance, are not going to get back to the dentist for a year or more, um, that we've done as much as possible in terms of, you know, good oral health, um, but also just really trying to take care of any needs in the day when they're able to get to the office and so the sort of focus on that. And then the last piece is uh, diversity. So um, we have found that um, you know, patients have a greater level of engagement um, if the sort of people that they're working with and being treated by represent their community. And um, that diversity ends up in, we think, better care, uh, also ends up in uh, better retention because um, people really sort of uh, relate to our communities. And so, um, as I say, at, at its core is understanding the challenge that families uh, face in terms of, you know, accessing care and maintaining care. And then everything we do is uh, really to sort of support making that possible and making it easier um, and making sure there's a level of engagement where they are likely to come back and continue on treatment plans. Thanks, Brian. And on the clinical side of things, I mean, can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, how clinicians interact with, especially, you know, the the underserved community and, and children's and the children and and I guess the families as well, because a lot of the families are involved. They're bringing the children in, um, 
is there is there an educational process? I mean, is it a little bit different than um, patients? And you you had experience uh, previously working at a multi specialty practice. So can you talk a little bit about the the differences? I think it starts with the interview process. Uh, when I'm interviewing, I make sure to share my story uh, so that they uh, can relate to it and they understand that um, I joined Benefits for the mission, and that's the and I'm still here uh, because of the mission. And that uh, due to that, I think it attracts a lot of like-minded leaders, and that includes dentists. Um, I interview a lot of new graduates as well as those with experience who've had their own practice but now want to give back to the community. And I think um, by starting at the interviewing process where we can meet uh, such individuals makes a big difference because they're coming in with that in mind. And then I think uh, during, we have a very thorough um, onboarding process where we talk about uh, what we do and uh, why we do it and how to do it successfully in, in an efficient manner so that uh, we are spending the time educating um, and uh, spending the time having consults with the parents because that's important. Um, that's one of the things I talk about a lot with our new dentists uh, when we're working with children, especially because uh, so many of us are so good with children, but we forget that the children came with adults and we have to make sure that we engage them because uh, the adults are the ones who are bringing the children to our practices. So, uh, and that's how we started. Uh, we started where we were only focusing on children and then we added access to care for the parents. And then now we see families and I think the transition itself shows how uh, we want to serve uh, the communities where we are, uh, where we exist. And I think uh, it's great that we have practices where the communities are. Um, for example, in Baltimore, we have five practices uh, in the city of Baltimore, because we know that um, even if you are 10 miles away uh, for some of our patients, that can be a big deal who don't have cars and access uh, to transportation as easily. So it's great that we make it easier for them to uh, take care of their oral health. And yeah, and Brian, I know Brian pointed that out earlier where, you know, public transportation is so important uh, mm -hmm. for access to care, especially in, in the inner city when people don't have cars. Um, this, um, maybe we'll start with you, Brian. Can you discuss some of the challenges that Benevis faces when you're supporting mostly Medicaid patient population and, and how you might manage that? Uh, because I, I know there are, you know, every one of the things that you hear in the DSO space is when you've seen one DSO, you've seen one DSO. So there are many out there that really don't um, serve the underserved, right? Medicaid patients. In fact, they kind of steer clear of that. Obviously, Benevis is part of the mission. You've embraced it and you're able to be successful. However, I'm sure there's still um, challenges. Yeah, thanks, Bill. So um couldn't agree more, you know, if you... Uh, you have seen one DSO, if you've seen one, um, uh, and, you know, Benevis is, I like to describe it as a purpose-built organization. Um, unlike uh, other DSOs, we actually built 115 of our 120 offices. So rather than through acquisition, they've been uh, sort of built in the communities where we identified a real need. Um, and the challenges really are sort of twofold. One is that um, it's just difficult for people who are oftentimes, you know, uh, in uh, Medicaid eligibility to get to an office. Um, you know, just life gets in the way, uh, you know, work, um, care, giving, uh, getting kids to and from school. Um, and so, you know, for us, for example, only 50% of our scheduled appointments show up in any one day. Um, and we have to do a lot to try to help people get to their appointment uh, by reminding them, by trying to adjust, making uh, availability if they need to reschedule. And then we have a lot where our teammates essentially have to juggle because inevitably what happens is you have 10 people show up at 10 o'clock and one person show up at 11 o'clock and trying to balance that both from a um, sort of care delivery, but also from a patient experience. The second thing is um, Medicaid pays, you know, about 70 cents on the dollar relative to sort of commercial or PPO or other 
uh, health insurance for dental. Um, and we, of course, are committed to delivering, you know, the same high quality care. And so in order to do that, we use, you know, what, you know, you might sort of call an extender model. So we call it assisted hygiene. Um, so um, the hygienist obviously is doing uh, the cleaning and uh, examination, and then the doctor is doing the oral health examination. But we use assistance to try to do as much as possible in prepping the patient, in uh, making sure some of the notes are recorded, in uh, any of the sort of uh, nutritional uh, follow-up counseling, things like that. And so by using this assisted hygiene model, um, we're able to sort of make it work where uh, we're effectively providing extensions for the caregivers, um, the clinicians, uh, and those two things, you know, uh, kind of dealing with the challenges that people face in getting to a scheduled appointment, and then making sure that we are uh, using the clinician time at its highest and best use of actually providing care are kind of the things that are most critical to us to be able to continue in the mission that we do. Jane, I'd love to get your feedback on this from the clinical perspective, how you deal with this, these challenges, because it is, it is pretty unique. And Brian's talking about, you know, patients coming in all at once or, or you know, having like lulls. So how do you, um, can, how do you deal with that? That's, that can be pretty challenging when a schedule is pretty predictable. And when it's not, it can be um, a little chaotic. Yeah, and I think that's why a lot of providers uh, who want to see Medicaid patients, they veer away from it because of the challenges that uh, Brian has mentioned. Uh, it's hard as a sole provider at an office to handle a situation where you don't know if the patients can show up or not, or um, and you can't hold them accountable to it. Um, so I think that having a numerous uh, multi-practitioner offices, that is one way that uh, can be helped uh, where we have, um, you know, two, three doctors at different offices. Uh, but also another method is that we have a support services um, department that helps with the uh, reminders, whether it be through texts or phone calls. And uh, so it doesn't have to just remain at the office level, which is so helpful. And that's where the whole uh, dental service organization aspect helps us um, because it allows us to, uh, as providers, focus on dentistry and not have to worry so much about the schedule being filled and the show rate and and uh, for it to be adjusted according to the individual offices. Because we do have some offices where the show rate may be 60% and another office where the show rate can be 30%. Um, but our uh, dental service organization support services understands that and they're able to um, support the offices uh, accordingly. So you have pretty creative scheduling. It sounds like it, that they can, they can adjust very, very quickly. Um, qu question about accessibility. So do, Brian, I'll ask you this. Why, why do you feel it's so hard for people that are covered by Medicaid to, to find a dentist today? Is it just that uh, a lot of the practices aren't accepting Medicaid? What what's what are your thoughts on this? Um, you know, there are a number of practices that um, uh, accept Medicaid sort of nominally, if you will, but they are really not set up to have the access and availability. Um, uh, and so it could be um, you know, many sort of different factors. Uh, they may not have kind of evening, Saturday hours. They may not have the appointment availability near term that oftentimes works with, you know, trying to balance sort of school and work. Um, and uh, then, you know, it may not be a location um, that is, you know, really accessible. And so uh, when you sort of factor all those things in, um, less than 20% of the dental offices in the U.S. see more than 100 Medicaid patients in a year. Um, so it really is sort of a, um, a small fraction uh, that really are sort of set up to be able to have the access and availability that really means they effectively can serve the community. Beyond the accessibility side of things, are there any other challenges that you see um, 
whether it's Medicaid or some of the patients that have the chip plans that that they're dealing with. I mean, it's so, so accessibility is one of them. But are there any other issues that that you happen to see or that you um, are up against? Um, you know, I uh, I just always have to think in terms of nutrition. So you know, I was I think we all know and group dentistry now um, uh, listeners know. You know, it is a challenge for uh, children in school and outside of school to get, you know, good, healthy meals at the right time in the right place. Um, and so um, uh, I mentioned that only because, you know, oral health is total health. And one of the many uh, sort of challenges that uh, communities that we serve face is in, you know, access and availability of, you know, great nutrition. And so, um you know, I think it, it falls into just the uh, overall challenges that um, communities that have high Medicaid population, um, you know, face in terms of just, <clears throat> um, you know, health uh, access and availability. Uh, and um, we try to do our part, uh, both in terms of access and availability, and also just in terms of kind of counseling uh, wherever possible to, uh, to help families. Uh, Dr. Wang, I'd love to find out from you how, how you do that as a, as a clinician. I mean, what's that education process? Uh, it's a great, great point. You talk about um, the the diet. Um, so, so is some of that education, some of that's affordability, I'm sure. Uh, it's expensive to get good food. Um, is some of that education as well? Yes. And uh, of course, and I think that uh, Brian mentioned uh, the assisted hygiene program we have. And I think that's a big part of it, uh, allowing hygienists because they are providers as well. And they in our model, we have assistants that support them with radiographs and other things that usually hygienists have to do. Um, So that allows the hygienists to have the time to really spend time talking to the patients um, and educating them and talking about the oral health care and how it affects the body, which um, I think hopefully uh, our goal is to ensure that uh, patients are uh, so good about the oral health care that they are seeing the hygienists more than the us, us dentists, right? So they spend so much time with them during the profi process. Uh, it's great that um the hygienists have that opportunity to do the educating aspect of it. Uh, we also um, uh, do a great job where uh, some, a lot of our offices will make efforts to attend community events, uh, go to schools whenever possible to talk about what we do and um, sp- uh, talk about oral hygiene, which I think is important. That's great. Yeah. And we've, um, this is definitely the first time we've had anyone from Benevis on the podcast. However, we have done many articles in the past uh, and, and we have a couple on, you know, some of the things that you do with the, you know, whether it's at the school level or community based. So that's, uh, and what I'll make sure we do is I dr- I'll drop a couple of those more recent article links in the show notes. So people all have access to those as well. I'm going to switch gears here. Uh, let's talk about uh, an issue that's been, gosh, going on for several years now is really, you know, recruitment and, you know, whether it's, you know, clinical recruitment, hygienist, assistant, uh, dentist, or even on the, you know, office manager side of things, there's been a huge challenges in the, in the dental industry, DSOs in particular. So, how does Benevis attract and then retain talent? I mean, it's it's so crucial. It's like you spend a lot of time recruiting, and then if you're not retaining them, it doesn't really matter. So um, maybe t- discuss that a little bit because it's a huge issue for most of the people in our audience. Sure, Bill. I'll jump in and uh, would love to have um, Dr. Wang uh, provide some commentary as well because she spends time on uh, campuses, you know, really trying to uh, make sure people understand Benevis. Um, so on the sort of recruitment talent acquisition side, uh, we've really spent a lot of effort in the last sort of 18 months uh, to try to clearly articulate the Benevis mission um, so that uh, for, you know, because because in essence, we know there just are more jobs than there are healthcare workers. Um, that applies to hygienists and dental assistants uh, and to dentists. Um, and so uh, what we have found is, you know, 
our best chance is to make sure we do a really good job of articulating uh, Benevis's mission because it does resonate with a portion of the people that are available to work. Um, and so uh, we just do as much as we can on that. On the, uh, in many ways, more important side of retention, because there are more jobs than people, um, obviously you want to make sure it's fulfilling work. Uh, with us, that has been a focus on investing in our people. Um, and we've done that uh, primarily through uh, training and certification. So on the training side, um, we used to actually not have a formal training program when dental assistants joined us. Uh, we now do. Uh, so we commit at least 40 hours of training so that they really kind of understand, you know, how to operate in the Benevis model, um, how to be successful in the Benevis model um, and how to feel supported. And then we have certification as they reach certain milestones, uh, whether they be um, uh, very technical around radiography or they be around um, their ability to sort of work um, in addition to the hygienist, uh, be able to work uh, in the operatory side with the dentist. And so by uh, kind of recognizing their accomplishments, we're effectively showing them how we're investing in them. Uh, and we find that you know, doing that same thing with hygienists uh, who then become kind of a, a lead hygienist for a region uh, are kind of the types of things that we do to invest in people, which I have found is really kind of your best chance of having people, you know, continue to work if they can see kind of growth for themselves uh, from a development standpoint. Um, Dr. Wang, I don't know if you have, uh, obviously, you know, we do a lot of that uh, with associate dentists who join us and maybe you can comment on some of the things that we have found to work. Oh, definitely. Uh, well, first of all, I think we attract uh, dental talent uh, because of the model, our model, which stresses operational and clinical partnership, uh, which is why I'm still here. Um, it exists at every level of, of the organization where Brian, as the CEO, works closely with uh, Dr. Mayfield, the chief uh, dental officer. And it's, so it starts at the executive level and it cascades to the office level where the office manager partners with the office dentist so that they're successful in um, just taking care of our patients. Um, but attracting is one thing. And uh, Bill, as you mentioned, retaining is another aspect, right, which is important. And we, um, Brian spoke on the hygiene growth, hygienist growth model, uh, but we also have a really growth, uh, great growth plan for our dentists, which is what I followed. Um, I joined as an associate dentist, um, then was given opportunities to train other new dentists, and then held the district dental director role where I worked uh, and helped to manage uh, about six offices in the district. And then now as a regional dental director, uh, I get to flex other aspects of leadership that I didn't imagine I would when I graduated dental school and where I get to work with the district dental directors in various states, but also help to train um, new associate dentists. Um, I think that's one of the most rewarding aspects of my job when uh, a dentist who I interviewed after they graduated dental school, uh, where I helped uh, their onboarding process, and now I see them in a, a leadership uh, role in the organization. So I think that that's a great way uh, that we have learned to retain great dental talent. Really tied into this, you've got you have something pretty unique uh, at Benevis, and we we actually featured this in an article uh, a couple of weeks back. So relatively recently, I'll make sure I drop uh, the article in the show notes. But it's really it's it's focused on your dentist men mentorship program, and I've been doing this for for a while. It looks like sixteen years. So uh, let, let's talk a little bit about. The mentorship program that you offer and and then what really makes that different than maybe some other uh, mentorship programs that exist sure i may all kind of give an overview of um you know what's new and then dr wang um can really uh speak to the specifics of kind of um you know what's what's involved in the sort of clinical training um but 
in many ways, um, we've now kind of evolved to uh, this is a more significant part of Benefice's growth. Um, so um, this year alone, uh, we will hire uh, about 35 new graduates from dental school. Um, and the mentorship program has gotten to the point where, you know, I think of it as always our version of Teach for America. Um, and I want to come back to probably the most important component of that. But before I do, um, it's just, you know, we have the ability because of the sort of uh, geographic focus we have where, you know, um, Dr. Wang mentioned, you know, we have five offices in Baltimore. Um, so when a new grad joins, um, they are uh, oftentimes partnered with an existing um, seasoned doc, and they're also in a sort of geographic cluster, uh, and then also have uh, a district dental director who spends a lot of time kind of coaching, mentoring, and support. Um, and so for a new grad in particular, uh, there are three things. One is it's highly supported. Uh, two is they're going to be very busy uh, because we uh, obviously have very busy practices. Uh, but then three, there is a growth opportunity to become a senior associate or to become a district dental director over time. And because they are exposed, they get a sense of, you know, the profile of those uh, sort of experienced and leadership uh, dentists that are in our organization but the one key component, as I mentioned, is, you know, I think of it as our version of Teach for America. They bring a lot to us. Um, so they bring um, their life experiences, their generational exposure, um, and oftentimes exposure to new technologies and new treatments. Um, and so they bring something much like students who go into Teach for America bring something to sort of those schools that they work with. Um, and so uh, it's a program that has been around, but it is larger, more structured, um, and we find uh, it's even more desirable uh, because in many cases, students have not had as much hands-on experience as they would like. Um, but uh, Dr. Ryan, maybe you could just, you know, because you do it every day, you know, talk about some of the sort of mentoring um, that does uh, happen and some of the clinical pathways that they are effectively trained on? Oh, definitely. Um, well, first off, I always tell the associate dentists when I'm starting off uh, my onboarding process with them is that, hey, I am here to be your biggest cheerleader because your success uh, dirt is a direct correlation to my success and the best care possible that we can deliver for our patients, which is the most important. If every decision is made in the interest of the patient, we can't help but be successful. And that starts with um, just being confident. Um, I think a lot of times our new graduates come to our practice um, just having been handheld through everything, uh, but to un have them understand that, hey, you are now a dentist. You have the autonomy need to make decisions as a provider, uh, but that we as district dental directors or regional dental directors, that we're here to support you and that uh, we are here to answer any questions that you may have or volley um, cases where we can talk about it. And that they know to know that they have that at their fingertip, I think is so helpful. Um, there have been many times where I've had dentists on uh, tell me, hey, I want to start doing root canals, but I'm a little nervous. And then I will tell them, um, I can visit your office on this date uh, from this time to this time. Um, schedule those patients at that time and I'll be at the office. 100% of the time, they don't even need me. But the fact that they knew that someone was there to bail them out or support them gave them the confidence to uh, just expand their skill set and uh, become better in their field. And I think that's a great part of it. Um, but also, we do treat a lot of children, and a lot of our dentists are general dentists. Uh, they don't have that exposure or training in dental school. Uh, so we spend a lot of time where they can um, just do uh, have better behavior behavior management techniques uh, where we talk about how to do uh, communicative guidance, tell, show, do, and different uh, skill sets uh, that allow them to be successful with children. And I think that that's helpful because um, uh, they uh, want that exposure and they want to be better at uh, being able to provide their care for young children. 
Thank you, uh, Dr. Wang. That's yeah. I mean, it's it's so critical. You have younger clinicians coming out of of, of school, and uh, they do need that mentorship, whether it's the support and, and just have somebody there, even if they really didn't need you. Um, but to know that they can rely on somebody that has more experience than them, uh, it's 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 a great it's a great idea. Uh, you've been doing it a long time, and you know when we survey. Uh, our audience, we survey young clinicians, um, clinicians looking to partner with DSOs, and that mentorship is is at the top. Education. What 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 type of? How are you going to continue to educate me? How are you going to support me? Uh, it's one of the roles of a DSO, right? Is it's not just it's not just the non clinical support. It's also the clinical support from clinicians. So, um, as we start to wrap things up here, a couple of final questions. And I'll ask both of you this, um, Brian, uh, from your perspective, are there any new technologies or innovations in the industry that that you're using or Benevis is evaluating to help you become more efficient? Anything that's really exciting out there that, that you've seen? Uh, yes, actually. Um, so on the sort of administrative side, uh, one of the greatest challenges that we face, as I mentioned, is only 50% of our scheduled appointments actually get fulfilled in any one day. Um, and that creates you know, real challenges for uh, our air delivery um, because, you know, again, we'll have 10 people show up at 10 o'clock and one, people, one person show up at 11 o'clock. But also, um, you know, just a, a frustrating patient experience because they have long wait times. Um, and we're actually using uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence uh, to uh, use sort of predictive technologies uh, in order to figure out who is likely to show and then balancing our schedule. And um, essentially, you know, there are attributes around someone's, you know, previous appointment experience around, you know, kind of the ways and times in which they confirmed or did not confirm. And then also just around, you know, their sort of um, age and other demographics. Uh, and we're using all that to build uh, more predictive schedules so that um, we sort of make sure we have uh, really solid schedules for those people that we know have a high propensity to show and that we're balancing the ones where it's likely that they're going to end up um, canceling, rescheduling, or no showing. Um, and uh, that's using uh, technology that just didn't exist, you know, two years ago um, to be able to look through, you know, our data. We will do over a million appointments a year. Um, and so looking through that data and effectively building uh, a propensity to show model. It's the thing that I am most excited about because it has the opportunity to um, really improve our caregivers' experience um, as well as improve the patient experience. Um, and I think, you know, a year from now, uh, people that are in a benefits office uh, are going to just, you know, not recognize it uh, relative to what they've seen with the historical volatility in terms of uh, sort of patient flow. That's great. Great. And, uh, and on the clinical side of things, uh, Dr. Wang, anything that you've seen that has really been a game changer for you? Um, yes, it's a Curadont. Curadont uh, is a product that's been around for a bit, but uh, now uh, Medicaid uh, reimbursement it has increased and is now uh it's being reimbursed at some of this in some of the states, which is great news uh, because it used to be just uh, silver diamide uh, fluoride that was available. Uh, but to have this uh, curadont, which is which doesn't leave a stain, uh, but still helps to repair teeth uh, where we would normally either treat or watch, it's great uh, because it's a non-invasive, non-staining fluoride treatment. Um, so we've rolled it out uh, in Connecticut. We plan to roll it out in Georgia. And, uh, and that's, I think that's one of the most exciting things that I've seen lately. Great. Thank you. Curadon. Okay. So that's, that's good. I have, I've, I've heard much about that in the past year. So it's great to hear that that is being reimbursed in, in certain States, uh, by Medicaid. Um, final question for you both. Um, it's kind of the crystal ball question that I ask just about everybody, but 
just uh, love to hear about your 2025 initiatives, what you feel of the future. And Brian, you kind of alluded to it earlier using your, you know, your, your, your technology that you're going to get yeah, the plan is to have a much smoother, more predictable schedule, better patient experience. So that's certainly one, sounds like one initiative. What else? Uh, the other major one is uh, we just have a tremendous opportunity to expand our provider base. And, um, you know, this year we will treat about 700,000 kids um, and not in 25, but probably by late 26, we think we'll probably end up treating close to a million kids um, because uh, in so many of our locations, uh, there just are not enough providers for the community. Um, and so really, really excited about um, uh, hiring even more new grads um, and building out the teams uh, to be able to reach that goal of a million. And then we'll go on to two million from there. Um, so in addition to uh, sort of an improved patient and team member experience, um, really excited about just the, the growth opportunity because there are you know, so many uh, people that just don't have providers in their area. Thank you, Brian. Um, Dr. Wang, any any final thoughts about that question, 2025 initiatives? I think it expands on what Brian said, um, to have more providers, but also have more specialty practices in our um, offices where uh, they can just come to our office and get the ortho care in an affordable way if the insurance isn't covered and have the oral surgery services, endo services, and all that in one place, which is which makes it easier for our patients. Um, and they can get the follow-up care that's recommended for them, which is very exciting. Excellent. Well, well th thank you both. This was um, a really great conversation. I um, I appreciate you both taking the time. If uh, someone wants to find out more, if you're in the audience and you're a clinician and you're looking for a new career opportunity, uh, you can go to benevis.com and there is a career tab that you can click on uh, to, to certainly find out more. See, so it looks like all the available um, career opportunities would be there. You can apply. Um, if you want to just learn more about the organization, you can certainly go to Benevis.com, see the information there. We have, like I mentioned earlier in the podcast, several articles about what Benevis is doing uh, at the practice level, community level. Uh, talk We discussed their mentorship program in detail, but just, uh, just a lot of great insights. So I would recommend that you check out their website and ours to find out more about Benevis. But uh, again, thank you, Dr. Wang, for being here today. And and Brian, great conversation. And thank you, everybody, for listening in. We always appreciate your support. And until next time, this is the Group Dentistry Now Show, and I am Bill Newman. Thank you. The Group Dentistry Now Show has listeners across North and South America, Europe, Asia, and Australia. If you like our show, subscribe today, and please tell your colleagues about us.